Hello and welcome to the third lecture from the last module of this course on community rights and forest governance. Earlier in this module, we learned about the spaces available in the law and the legal procedures for communities to respond to decisions about the purposes for which forests are going to be used for. We understood that communities can influence decisions to acquire and divert forests for so-called non-forest purposes and that they can also have a role in the declaration of critical tiger reserves and critical wildlife habitats. Now, among the consequences of a decision to divert some forest land for a non-forest purpose or to declare an inviolate space for conservation on that land could be that the communities living on that land have to suffer from involuntary displacement. In this lecture, you can learn how communities can respond to decisions relocating them from forest landscapes. Now, there are some general rules applicable in all cases of relocation from forest land. The first is that no member of a forest dwelling scheduled tribe or other traditional forest dwelling community can be removed from forest land under his occupation till the recognition and verification procedure under the Forest Rights Act is complete. The second is that all relocation must comply with the requirements of the right to fair compensation and transparency in Land Acquisition, Rehabilitation and Resettlement Act 2013. Let us learn about some of these requirements now. It is mandatory to conduct a Social Impact Assessment or SIA and prepare a Social Impact Management Plan or SMP for acquisition of land. An instrument that helps assess and determine the implications of land acquisition on the affected community and people. An SIA is expected to minimize the risks involved in displacement, rehabilitation, compensation and resettlement. The government has to carry out the SIA in consultation with the concerned panchayat, municipality or municipal corporation at the village level or ward level in the affected area. While conducting the SIA, the government is also required to ensure adequate representation to the representatives of panchayat, gram sabha, municipality or municipal corporation as the case may be to ascertain the views of the affected families and record them in the social impact assessment report the government also has to ensure that a public hearing is held at the affected area after giving adequate publicity to it the entire process of social impact assessment is an opportunity for communities to intervene in the process of acquisition and voice their concerns the collector has to determine the market value of the land to be acquired and he shall calculate the total amount of compensation to be paid to the landowner the parameters to be considered by the collector also include the damage that is expected to be sustained by the person because of the loss of the land, the loss of crops and the change of residence. The government must also prepare a rehabilitation and resettlement scheme. This scheme must include details of what each person whose rights are being acquired is entitled to, the list of government buildings in the resettlement area, the details of public amenities and infrastructural facilities to be provided there, and the time limit for implementing it. A draft of it has to be presented at public hearings at which forest dwellers can submit their objections. These public hearings have to be conducted in every Gram Sabha where more than 25% of land belonging to that Gram Sabha or municipality is being acquired. After this draft and the objections to it have been reviewed by the collector of that area and any changes have been made to it by the government, a summary of the scheme has to be published as part of the official declaration of the acquisition. The collector has to pass rehabilitation and resettlement awards for each affected family. These awards must include details such as the rehabilitation and resettlement amount payable to the family, the bank account number of the person to which the rehabilitation and resettlement award must be transferred, the particulars of the house site and the house to be allotted, the particulars of land allotted to the displaced families. In every resettlement area, the collector has to ensure some infrastructural facilities and basic minimum amenities. The Resettlement and Rehabilitation Scheme and the Rehabilitation and Resettlement Award are two very important sources of information for forest dwelling communities. There be, could be a scenario where a community is served a notice to relocate from an area. Uh, you need to move from your homestead, uh, leave your uh, homes, your livelihoods, everything and move to another area. 
the first thing to figure out is what is that notice for uh, if that notice is for really relocation for the purposes of wildlife uh, protection area that is being uh, you know being created or that uh, you know relocation is under land acquisition laws uh, it is important to do that because how you really relate to the process and procedure and requirements will really differ for each one of these but what is the common thread one common thread in this whole thing is very clearly that any rule or rather no relocation can take place without a prior approved relocation or a rehabilitation plan that plan has to be developed under the wildlife act it would be with the chief wildlife warden and the district collector uh, under the you know the land acquisition processes again the district collector's office will play a very important role in what is that uh, is that plan uh in either of these cases actually accepting your options should happen ideally after you know what your options are so it's not signing off uh on any document or not a questioning even the local bodies the panchayat bodies or your urban uh, local bodies to figure out what your options are where are you going to be relocated is that land actually ready for legal relocation does that land actually give you a uh, comparative uh, life and lifestyle uh, based on what your uh, where where you're living i think that is very important for you to figure out uh, there have been instances where affected villages have actually said gone to the district collector's office and demanded that they be shown what that land is there have been conservation groups who have engaged in relocation processes they they talk about uh, you know working with the communities and actually saying that okay you go and see what options are in front of you to relocate uh, or, or or rehabilitate uh, in a place so relocate and rehabilitate although are very uh, very distinct words relocation can just me just picking up anybody from one place and putting them in another place whereas rehabilitation is much more uh, of a social process where you're trying to re uh, replicate and replace what people have in a place but in either of these cases really figuring out where you're going to go what is the land available what are the uh, you know uh, facilities available there can you actually replicate the life that you would like to replicate in that area and of course based on what the law allows you to do uh, is 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 very critical uh, before you actually accept a relocation exercise the other thing that happens is when especially when it comes to tiger reserves your options could be to actually agree to a relocation by the forest department or taking a 10 lakh rupee package and and moving on now that is also an extremely important process uh, for anybody uh, to undertake because i think it's important for uh, uh, communities to understand the implications of just taking 10 lakhs and uh, not relying on the forest department or any other government agencies to be relocated uh, from one place to the other um, and also i mean figuring out uh, you know is it is it worth waiting for that relocation process uh, or you would just like to like to move all those things are i mean these are extremely political uh, and uh, justice related processes but i think being understanding and demanding for all your options before any decision is taken uh, and also knowing that there are certain pro processes where your consent will need to be sought i think will be important for you to uh, there are there are no uh, there are no uh, ways out to that uh, really you need to really go out there and ask for the, those that material let us now look at some important offices involved in the processes of resettlement and rehabilitation for the settlement of disputes in relation to acquisitions both the state and central governments can appoint people qualified under the law to the position of land acquisition rehabilitation and resettlement authority any person who has not accepted the provisions of the award in relation to the resettlement and rehabilitation can ask the collector to refer this matter to the authority the application made to the collector has to state the grounds for objection to the award every state government also has a commissioner for rehabilitation and resettlement responsible for supervising the formulation and proper implementation of rehabilitation and resettlement schemes and a monitoring committee for reviewing and monitoring the implementation of rehabilitation and resettlement schemes the commissioner is responsible for conducting social audits of the implementation of resettlement schemes in consultation with gram sabhas 
So central India, I think there was, uh, there is, you would have heard of the Hasdevarand forest area. Uh, a lot of villages were served uh, notice under the Coal Bearing Areas Act to uh, to be able to be re, uh, rehabilitated from that area. Um, and uh, if you talk to the villagers uh, in, in such areas, some of the uh, villagers who really tried to ask the district authorities uh, more uh, information, the moment they have served a notice, uh, really reading up what that notice is saying, under which law has the no notice been served, is it under the land acquisition law, is it under the coal bearing areas or act. So actually calling for a meeting of concerned people in the village, even before it's opened up to the larger village assembly and finding out what is the notice being served under, where under which acquisition law is your uh, land being acquired under. And only that will open up which authorities you need to speak to. What is what is the policy or the process or the law under which your rehabilitation will take place to really ascertain your options. Once that's done, and in this village, uh, it was very clear it was under the Coal Bearing Areas Act. Then subsequently reading up uh, what are your rehabilitation possibilities. There often could be two or three uh, rehabilitation policies. And walking up to the district collector's office and finding out Based on a social impact assessment, have you prepared uh, an r and plan? If the social impact assessment is, has been exempt, then asking for an r and plan, uh, you know, from the district collector's office to a certain have all the rights that we are talking about being listed there. Uh, you know, uh, and based on that, also developing a strategy whether you want to agree to this r and plan, whether you don't want to agree to this r and plan. That requires a series of convenings in a meeting, uh, in a village or, or I would even say a peri-urban area where this, this option uh, or an urban area where this, this issue could be arise, uh, could come up. So really figuring out what your options are in terms of what the law provides, what the documents tell you, this is your r, &R plan that is, that is in front of you and then figuring out, you know, where is the land for rehabilitation. Uh, so, uh, in this particular case, the villagers walked up to the, uh, you know, the uh, collector's office and said, show us the land. Then they went to the land area and realized actually that the houses that have been constructed are just bare bone sort of houses. Some of the community infrastructure uh, is not available. Farming is not a possibility. So, so far they have actually held back moving, saying that we want to create as close, even if, if we... A, we don't want to move. B, if we want to, if for those people who do agree to move, this is not the place you want to be. So I think it just it just illustrates the kind of things you would need to keep in mind when it comes to acquisition uh, of land under any of the laws that we are taking talking about here. Now let us look at some laws that apply to resettlement in specific scenarios. We will first look at resettlement from scheduled areas and then resettlement for the purposes of wildlife conservation. Some of these provisions may overlap and there can be situations where both sets of laws apply. In scheduled areas, as we have learnt, the government must be able to demonstrate that the acquisition of that land was the last resort. Further, before the notification of acquisition, the government must secure the consent of the concerned Gram Sabha or the Panchayats or the Autonomous District Councils at the appropriate level. For such an acquisition to proceed, the government also has to prepare a development plan that, among other things, contains the details of a program for the development of alternate fuel, fodder and non-timber forest produce resources on non-forest lands within a period of five years, sufficient to meet the requirements of tribal communities as well as the scheduled castes. The affected families of the scheduled tribes, including those who are rights holders under the Forest Rights Act, should as far as possible be resettled in the same scheduled area in a compact block so that they can retain their ethnic, linguistic and cultural identity. The resettlement areas predominantly inhabited by the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes shall also get land free of cost for community and social gatherings. We must note, however, that this law does not apply to areas where acquisition proceedings were concluded before the law came into being. In those cases, we must look at the provisions of the 1898 law and applicable resettlement and rehabilitation policies. In cases where compensation was not paid under the previous regime, the compensation provisions of the 2013 law will apply. We also need to note that some provisions also vary among states because of state-specific amendments to the 2013 law. 
For instance, the process of conducting an SIA under the Uttar Pradesh rules is a lot less comprehensive. If you are faced with a situation where the land acquisition law is applicable, then you must also check whether any state amendments have changed the application of the central law. In the case of resettlement for the purposes of creating inviolate areas for wildlife conservation, the state wildlife departments have to prepare resettlement or alternatives packages that provide a secure livelihood for affected individuals and communities and fulfill the requirements of the land acquisition law. The wildlife departments have to obtain the free informed and written consent of the Gram Sabhas in the areas concerned to the proposed resettlement and to the package. Further, no resettlement can take place before the facilities and land allocation at the resettlement location are complete according to this package. Similarly, for the creation of inviolate spaces for tiger conservation, the wildlife department has to prepare a resettlement or alternative package that provides for the livelihood of affected individuals and communities and fulfills the requirements set out in the National Relief and Rehabilitation Policy. The departments must obtain the informed consent of the Gram Sabhas concerned and the persons affected by this resettlement program. Further, no resettlement can begin unless the facilities and land allocation at the resettlement location are provided under this program. Under the Project Tiger Scheme, people who may be relocated from the core areas of critical tiger habitats are given two options. The first is that each family will be paid Rs 10 lakhs, but will not be supported by the Forest Department with any rehabilitation or relocation process. The second is for families to go through the relocation and rehabilitation program with the Forest Department. The package for each family will still be worth Rs 10 lakhs, but the scheme has clearly indicated how that amount should be apportioned between procurement of agricultural land, settlement of rights, homestead land and house construction, and community facilities such as irrigation and sanitation. The other is um, really about, um, you know, uh, relocation from a wildlife area. Here as we, uh, you know, one of the most important things to re really figure out is as um, uh, as we've been talking about is uh, uh, whether you do need to be uh, relocated or not and whether your rights can be uh, settled in such a way that they can continue, uh, you can continue to exercise those rights. Now, there, there could be two options for you in terms of a relocation issue. One, you could be probably, uh, it could be an issue of um, curtailed access to say a forest area or a grazing patch or any other place which you've been historically been using for livelihoods. Your homestead is not impacted, just the area you're dependent on for occupation and livelihoods is, is getting impacted or getting cordoned off. The other could be that both that and your homestead is being uh, you know, uh, relocated. The third option could be only your home is being relocated but your access to forest is is there is no problem with it. So I think in each of these cases, um, I think there have been different kinds of examples uh, where uh, where conservation groups have worked with uh, you know uh, with uh, affected people, uh, people who are going to be uh, relocated as part of a national park uh, being declared. They have uh, what is stated uh, is that they've collaborated on actually figuring out working with the forest department and going and checking out which land they have. And finally, agreed to a package. There is, of course, critiques to this, but there is a, there are examples that people have pr presented that this could happen. In other instances, uh, communities, after learning about their options, say in Central India and other parts, have just said no that we were not going to move from that area because um, you know the Forest Rights Act process has not been completed. Uh, your records where you're doing settled settlement of rights do not have um, all all the claimants on it. Um, and also, we we actually do not would would not really like to relocate from that area. So there is a bit of resistance uh, that has happened, and resistance to actually relocate that area where people have actually gone and occupied the areas. And in situations like this, uh, you know, the contestation and uh, uh, contestation much uh, and adversarial action is uh, is much more stronger that you see in, in some of these places. That brings us to the end of this lecture on how forest dwelling communities can use the laws and procedures that we learnt in the previous modules to respond to involuntary displacement from the areas they are living in. We learnt 
some of the general rules that communities can use in all such cases of displacement from forest areas. We also learned some specific rules that communities can use when they are displaced from scheduled areas and when they are displaced for the purpose of wildlife conservation. Thank you for watching.